Thank you. We now move to topical questions. Question one, Richard Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government <coughs> how it will increase protection for people subject to emergency detention under the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003. Cabinet Secretary Robs. Emergency detention under the 2003 Act is only permissible where it is necessary as a matter of urgency because of a significant risk to the health, safety or welfare of the patient or the safety of others. Medical practitioners are required to seek agreement from a mental health officer unless it is impractical for them to do so, for example, where there is an immediate serious or life-threatening danger to the patient and or others around the patient. I am concerned by low levels of involvement by mental health officers in some areas as identified by the Mental Welfare Commission in its annual monitoring report in September 2015. Consent by mental health officers is an important safeguard and it is essential that local authorities ensure they have the appropriate levels of staff in place to meet statutory duties. I am pleased to note that the Mental Welfare Commission has plans to meet with one health board where this appears to be a particular issue and I look forward to hearing the outcomes of that engagement. I have also asked the Mental Welfare Commission to undertake analysis of the reasons why the medical practitioner has reported it was impractical for them to consult a mental health officer. And separately, I have asked the Scottish Government's Chief Social Work Advisor to investigate issues about the shortfall in mental health officers in local authorities with Chief Social Work Officers and expect him to report back by the end of April. Richard Simpson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very helpful reply? The, um, the situation is now that uh, in, in the last report from the Mental Welfare Commission, as she indicated, 45 per cent of those detained under the emergency detention system did not have an MHO. But this was an increase from 42 per cent in the previous year and 37 per cent the year before. So we have been in a deteriorating situation which the Mental Welfare Commission has drawn attention to in repeated reports. So I wonder, in given the new funding that's coming forward, whether she would consider specifically allocating additional funds to the local authorities to recruit more mental health officers. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Richard Simpson uh, for his, his uh, question and recognise his, his interest uh, in this. Uh, as he points out, the, the Mental Welfare Commission, uh, their annual monitoring report, uh, has um, highlighted some of these issues. They highlighted a number of issues. They highlighted that the increase in new compulsory treatment is largely due to an increase in using the Act to admit older people to hospital, for example, but that the reasons behind the rise in compulsory treatment are unclear. So there are a number of things we need to understand uh, better. Um, and also the, um, the important point being around short-term detention uh, certificates um, uh, should be granted wherever possible in preference to an emergency detention certificate given the additional protections that they provide for the patient. So there are a number of issues that I think we need uh, to look at and to understand better, which is why in my original um, answer I've asked for a number of pieces of work to, to look at this to understand better some of the reasons but more importantly what action we can take. Now Richard Simpson asked about the, the resources that have been allocated uh, to health uh, over the next uh, five years, 150 million of additional resources. Now of course he'll be aware obviously that this um, the, there is a, a, a clear uh, separation between the roles of the mental health officers employed by local authorities uh, and, uh, and the NHS for good reason that they may be investigating issues within the NHS, which is why um, where I would normally point to IGBs being the territory where these things can be resolved. There is a more complex issue here because of the nature of potential conflict of interest we need to be quite careful about. However, I will, what I will do is once we have the reports back and if that points to specific action that needs to be taken and if there's an element of resourcing behind that then of course I'll give consideration to whether or not uh, there requires to be uh, further uh, uh, work in that domain. But I think we should wait and see what the issues are first. And I commend the Cabinet Secretary for both her replies, which do indicate an, uh, a concern about this problem, which has been getting worse. Um, the other aspect is the one that I always raise in these circumstances, and that is to look at the variation between different boards, and she alluded to that in her first answer. 
but it, it, they specifically the Mental Welfare Commission said that it concerns us that in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, the area of the highest use of emergency detention in Scotland, and we should remember it also tends to be more in deprived areas that these detention orders are used, the proportion of EDCs with consent is even lower, at 28%, down from 37% the previous year. When 72% of people are not getting an MHO, I think it does require fairly urgent attention, though I understand from a first answer that, that clearly that's the one that Mental Welfare Commission are going to have a close look at. Cabinet, sir. Yes, I mean, the, a number of local authorities obviously responded to um, the inquiries made by newspaper reports at the weekend and laid out um, some of their responses to that in terms of their numbers of MHOs and also how they organise that service. However, you know, Richard Simpson is, is right to highlight you know, particular concerns of, of the Greater Glasgow and Clyde and the, the local authorities within the Greater Glasgow and Clyde area. Um, that's why, of course, the, the Mental Welfare Commission do have plans to, to meet uh, with uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde um, to look at their figures um, in particular, but also what lies behind that and, more importantly, what action can be taken to overcome uh, some of the concerns that Richard Simpson has raised. Very happy to keep Richard Simpson informed of uh, <coughs> these discussions and, importantly, the outcomes from those. Mary Scanlon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given that the shortage of mental health officers has been an increasing problem for some time, uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, given that mental health officer in terms of sectioning patients, given that this is not a legal requirement, it is an important safeguard and it is best practice, will the Government consider now making uh, a mental health officer input and support a legal requirement? in order to ensure that that input happens at the time a patient is sectioned and ensure that numbers are now brought forward to be fully trained and suitably qualified to fill the gap? Well, I, mean, I, I understand Mary Scanlon's concern here. Um, I mean, first of all, on the, the shortage, I mean, there are issues around the the requirements of, um, of skill level and qualification to become a mental health officer, which immediately reduces the pool of people available. So there are some issues there around being able to recruit uh, mental health officers that I think we need to look at. And, and I'm keen to look at what, what more can be done to perhaps expand the, the, um, the interest in, in that career. Uh, I think we have to be cautious around the legislative um, suggestion that Mary Scanlon made because, as I laid out in my um, original answer, that where there is an immediate serious or life-threatening danger to the patient or others around the patient, it would be wrong, I think, to need to wait in, in order for a mental health officer's involvement if there are absolutely immediate concerns about um, welfare and safety and you can understand that you know sometimes these things have to move very very quickly however the best practice of course is to involve a, a mental health officer so I think it's about getting the balance here that we don't restrict action being taken that is required for immediate um, safety um, of, the, of the patient and potentially others around them as well um, with the best practice of involving a mental health officer. Again, I would be happy to keep Mary Scanlon involved of some of these discussions that are um, going to be taken forward with the Mental Welfare Commission and the Chief Social Work Advisor. Question two, Willard Rennie. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reports that plans for a high-speed rail link between Glasgow and Edinburgh have been shelved. Minister Derek Mackay. Uh, it has not been shelved. I refer the member to my recent written answer to Tavish Scott on this issue, in which I made clear it is not possible to progress planning for a high-speed rail link between Edinburgh and Glasgow any further until a cross-border high-speed route is identified. Once that happens, we can consider integrating plans. The Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities has also made clear, both in public at the High Speed Rail Conference in Glasgow last September and in this chamber in response to a direct question from Willie Rennie on the 24th of February 2015 that connecting Edinburgh and Glasgow with a high speed rail link is inextricably linked to the route options coming from the south. 
I can also advise that the joint work currently being undertaken with the Department for Transport to identify route options for extending high-speed rail into Scotland is now nearing completion and that the Cabinet Secretary fully expects to be in a position to share these findings in the coming months. Paul Rennie. But the Scottish Government grandly told us that the high-speed rail link between Glasgow and Edinburgh was not dependent on the UK scheme, with journey times of just 30 minutes, they said, between Glasgow and Edinburgh, could be done independently by 2024, 10 years ahead of any UK plans. Nicola Sturgeon, in fact, said Scotland would fire ahead, would not wait for Westminster. When was the Minister planning to tell us that the Government is waiting after all? Glasgow to Edinburgh journey times won't be 30 minutes by 2024. Will they? Minister. Well, in terms of sharing information with Parliament, I have answered a parliamentary question, but even before that there has been a couple of debates. Uh, one was in a committee uh, with Keith Brown, who was then Minister for Transport, uh, in answer to, to Alec Johnston on 5 February 2014, which explained uh, this position. I also mentioned the investment in Egypt, Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Project, which is very much underway. And in answer to Willie Rennie, Keith Brown explained the position on the 24th of February uh, 2015. So I think the position has been shared uh, with the Chamber and, of course, shared in an answer uh, to a parliamentary question. And in terms of the infrastructure investment plan, it covers in a number of sections in the, the plan that we've still got the ambitions for high-speed rail. Uh, but, yes, I've said that it, it makes sense to to see what is proposed in terms of high-speed rail coming from the south, and that work has been undertaken in partnership with the UK Government. And as I have said, the Cabinet Secretary will say more about that in the coming months and how we are working with UK Government high-speed too. But in terms of 2012, uh, when that position uh, was outlined, there was not a commitment from UK Government, there was not even a suggestion from UK Government that high-speed rail would come to Scotland. In fact, the commitments at the time was simply to take high-speed rail from London to Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds by 2032. So what the government was doing with our partners and stakeholders was advocating a case to bring high-speed rail to Scotland and we've worked in partnership with the UK government to progress that and there is now that opportunity to integrate our ambitions and our aspirations which we have stated in a way that works in partnership and is a sensible approach. But what I don't understand is why the Deputy First Minister, now the First Minister, announced at Glasgow Central Station that with just within 12 years that journey times between two cities would be cut to less than half an hour. Now we just simply know that it was overblown hyperbole. It was rhetoric in the extreme. And what we need to know now is why the scheme was cancelled, why it shelved. The, the Minister had the business plan back in September 2014. Is he now going to publish it? Minister. I have said that the Cabinet Secretary will outline the findings from our joint study and our work over the coming months. We are doing that in partnership with the UK Government, and that should not be preempted when I am saying that the aspirations for high-speed rail connecting Glasgow and Edinburgh with high-speed rail clearly can be integrated with the proposals coming from uh, the South. So I think that is a sensible approach. That is what the Cabinet Secretary will outline. The findings from uh, that work. We still have the aspirations for high-speed rail. Uh, I have covered that. I have covered how these issues have been discussed in Parliament before, both in the Chamber, in response to Willie Rennie and at committee. In answer to Alec Johnston, the records are there. I am happy to share the notes that I have that cover the approach that the Government has taken. So it really is not news and it really is not uh, new, but when it comes to ongoing investment in rail, I know that Willie Rennie will be very aware of the Edinburgh to Glasgow improvement project, which is over £700 million of investment uh, in terms of that whole package, which will improve journey times, which will invest in rolling stock and new stations. So this government is investing in rail uh, in our country, and particularly between the cities of Glasgow and Edinburgh. But there will be more to come in terms of high-speed rail, but in partnership with the UK government. I thought that was a kind of partnership working that Willie Rennie would have appreciated being the constructive and consensual figure uh, that he is working through the Department for Transport. And the Cabinet Secretary will be able to say more about high-speed rail uh, later in the next few months. Alex Johnson. Surely, regardless of where the high-speed link crosses the border, whether it's the East Coast or the West Coast, 
a high-speed link between Edinburgh and Glasgow will be integral to the completion of that system. Is it therefore so difficult to take forward that project at an earlier stage than the simply waiting to decide where it's going to come in? It is interesting that both members who have been given the answers before are back expressing surprise at the answers uh, now. Uh, Keith Brown was able to say at the time that it makes sense to consider um, both proposals. Now, if High Speed Rail has options to connect Edinburgh and Glasgow, or one city then connecting them, sh sh surely it's right that we assess our proposals in that light, integrating the proposals in terms of Edinburgh and Glasgow in view and in light of what is proposed for high speed rail coming from the south. I think that is a sensible and a fair rationale to spend public money to make the right assumptions and options coming forward. And as I say, once the Cabinet Secretary is in a position to report to the Chamber, uh, following the work from UK Government, uh, then I think we will see a sensible way forward. But our aspirations have not changed in bringing high speed rail to Scotland and continuing to invest in rail and those high-speed connections, and that is clearly expressed in the Infrastructure and Investment Plan. Thank you, Minister. That concludes topical questions, and then brings, that then brings us to the next item of business, which is.